Just a boy turning 17 Took me away from my home in Abilene I was sworn I'm a soldier now I was trained to survive Welcome to Stories of Sacrifice, American POW MIA's podcast. I'm your host and lead researcher, John Bear. Welcome to today's Story of Sacrifice. Today we are bringing you a story about Captain Ned Raymond Harold, Her- pilot during Vietnam. His story is linked to many other Vietnam missing in action because of just one target, the dragon's jaw. Captain Ned Raymond Harold was born January 8, 1941 in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. He grew up in Plainfield, New Jersey. His home of record is New Brunswick, New Jersey, and he graduated from Plainfield High School in 1958. During high school, he was a camp counselor. His interest included track, baseball, playing trumpet, camping, travel, all sports, and the Civil War studies. Ned attended Rutgers University in New Brunswick and was a member of the Air Force ROTC program and the Zeta Phi fraternity. He received his Bachelor's of Art in 1962 and his Master's in Art in 1963, both in education. Captain Harold entered the U.S. Air Force on July 11, 1963, where he attended, attained the rank of Captain He received his wings as a qualified jet fighter pilot at Craig Air Force Base in Selma, Alabama. While there, Harold was awarded the Class Cup for leadership. He was one of very few selected to be trained to fly the new F-4C jet fighters, which had a cruising speed at 1,600 miles an hour. Harold was a member of the 497th Tactical Fighter Squadron and was assigned to Ubin Air Force Base, Thailand during his service in Vietnam. Harold was awarded the Purple Heart, the Air Medal with five oak leaf clusters, the Distinguished Flying Cross with one oak leaf cluster, and the Outstanding Military Graduate Pilot Training Award. Captain Harold is listed as missing in action as of May 31, 1966. He is survived by his wife, Tracy, along with two daughters, Cameron and Kimberly, who we hope to have on the podcast someday to talk with us more about him. There is a memorial at Rutgers University in New Brunswick dedicated to the graduates who were killed or missing in action from the Vietnam War. Harold's name is listed among those missing. In a synopsis from the POW Network as to the circumstances of loss behind those that are listed as missing in action, the Tan Ho Railroad and Highway Bridge spanning the Song Ma River is located three miles north of Tan Ho, the capital of Annan Providence, North Vietnam. It is a replacement for the original French-built bridge destroyed by the Viet Minh in 1945. They simply loaded two locomotives with explosives and ran them together in the middle of the bridge. In 1957, the North Vietnamese rebuilt the bridge. The new bridge, completed in 1964, was 540 feet long, 56 feet wide, and about 50 feet above the river. The Vietnamese called it Ham Rong, or the Dragon's Jaw. Ho Chi Minh himself attended the dedication. The bridge had two steel through truss spans which rested in the center on a massive reinforced concrete pier 16 feet in diameter and on concrete abutments at the other ends. Hills on both sides of the river provided solid bracing for the structure. Between 1965 and 1972, Eight concrete piers were added near their approaches to give additional resistance to bomb damage. A one-meter gauge single railway track ran down the 12-foot wide center, and 20-foot wide concrete highways were on each side. This giant would prove to be one of the single most challenging targets for American air power in Vietnam. 104 American pilots were shot down over a 75-square-mile area around the Dragon during the war. 
In March 1965, the decision to interdict the North Vietnamese rail system south of the 20th parallel led immediately to the April 3, 1965 strike against the Tan Ho Bridge. Lieutenant Robin Reisner was designated overall mission coordinator for the attack. He assembled a force consisting of 79 aircraft, 46 F-105s, 21 F-100s, 2 RF-101s, and 10 KC-135 tankers. The F-100s came from a base in South Vietnam, while the rest of the aircraft were from squadrons, TDY at various Thailand bases. 16 of the 46 thuds, or F-105s, were loaded with pairs of bullpup missiles, and each of the remaining 30 carried eight 750-pound general-purpose bombs. The aircraft that carried the missiles and half of the bombs were scheduled to strike the bridge. The other remaining 15 would provide flak suppression. The plan called for individual flights of four F-105s from Kran and Tai, which would be air-refueled over the Mekong River before tracking across Laos to an initial point, or IP, three minutes south of the bridge. After weapons release, the plan called for all aircraft to continue east over the Gulf of Tonkin, where rejoin would take place, and a Navy destroyer would be available to recover anyone who had to eject due to battle damage or other causes. After rejoin, all aircraft would return to their bases, hopefully to the tune of the Ham Rong Bridge is falling down. Shortly after noon on April 3rd, aircraft Rolling Thunder Mission 9 Alpha climbed into the Southeast Asia skies on their journey to the bridge. The sun glinting through the haze was making the target somewhat difficult to acquire, but Reisner led the way down the chute and 250-pound missiles were soon exploding on the target. Since only one bullpup missile could be fired at a time, each pilot had to make two firing passes. On a second pass, Lt. Col. Reisner's aircraft took a hit just as the bullpup hit the bridge, fighting a serious fuel leak and smoke-filled cockpit in addition to anti-aircraft fire from the enemy. He nursed his crippled aircraft to Da Nang and to safety. The Dragon would not be so kind on another day. The first two flights had already left the target when Captain Bill Mayerhalt, number three man in the third flight, rolled his Thunder Chief into a dive and squeezed off a bullpup. The missile streaked toward the bridge, and as the smoke cleared from the previous attacks, Captain Mayerhalt was shocked to see no visible damage to the bridge. The bullpups were merely charring the heavy steel and concrete structure. The remaining missile attacks confirmed that the firing bullpups at the Dragon was about as effective as shooting BB pellets at a Sherman tank. The bombers, undaunted, came in for the attack only to see their payload drift to the far bank because of very strong southwest wind. First Lieutenant George C. Smith's F-100D was shot down near the target point as he suppressed flak. The anti-aircraft resistance was much stronger than anticipated. No radio contact could be made with Smith, nor could other aircraft locate him. First Lieutenant Smith was listed as missing in action and no further word has been heard of him. The last flight of the day, led by Captain Carl L.S. Smitty Harris, adjusted their aiming points and scored several good hits on the roadway and superstructure. Smitty tried to assess the bomb damage, but could not because of the smoke coming from the dragon's jaw. The smoke would prove to be an ominous warning of things to come. Lieutenant Commander Raymond A. Bogdan was north of the dragon when his F-4C bomber was shot down. Ray was captured by the North Vietnamese and held at various POW camps and near Hanoi until his release in February 1973. It's entirely not clear that the U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander had a direct role in the attack on the bridge, but was probably knocked out by the same anti-aircraft fire. Captain Herschel S. Morgan's RF-101 was hit and went down some 75 miles southwest of the target area, seriously injuring the pilot. Captain Morgan was captured and held in and around Hanoi until his release in 1973. When the smoke cleared, observer aircraft found the bridge still spanned the river. 32 bullpups and 10 dozen 750-pound bombs had been aimed at the bridge, and numerous hits had charred every part of the structure, yet it showed no sign of going down. A restrike was ordered for the next day. Stories of Sacrifice would like to thank MyHeritage for the use of their genealogy database and their photo app, Deep Nostalgia, which I use to fix, enhance, and colorize, and animate photos of our missing in action to share with our family. Four score and seven years ago, our ancestors dreamed that we would build our family tree and make fascinating discoveries about our family history. I use MyHeritage.com to embark on my journey. And I entered a few names into my family tree. 
My heritage found riches of information about my ancestors, family trees, and records galore. I colorized and sharpened old family photos and can now see them in a whole new light. My heritage even connected me with new cousins around the world, like Dave and his wife Susie. Congrats, dear boy. Call an aid. <laughs> Start today on MyHeritage.com and bring your family history to life. Creating a lasting legacy of your family, by your family, for your family. How did I do? Be honest. He did good there, Abe. And thank you to MyHeritage for your continued support of the Stories of Sacrifice podcast. The following day, flights with call signs steel, iron, copper, moon, carbon, zinc, Argon, Graphite, Esso, Mobile, Shell, Petrol, and Cadillac DBA Bomb Damage Assessment Flight assembled at IP to try to once again knock out the Dragon. On this day, Captain Carlisle Smitty Harris was flying as call sign Steel 3. Steel 3 took the lead and orientated himself for, the, for his run on a 300 degree heading. He reported that his bombs had impacted on the target on the eastern edge of the bridge. Steel 3 was on fire as soon as he left the target. Radio contact was garbled, and still lead, still two, and still four watched helplessly as Smitty's aircraft, emitting a flame for 20 feet behind, headed due west of the target. All flight members had him in sight until the fire died out, but observed no parachute, nor did they see the aircraft impact the ground. Smitty's aircraft had been hit by a MiG, whose pilot later recounted the incident in Vietnam Courier on April 15, 1965. It was not until much later that it would be learned that Smitty had been captured by the North Vietnamese. Smitty was held prisoner for eight years and released in 1973. Fellow POWs credit Smitty with introducing the TAP code, which enabled them to communicate with each other while in the prison. MiGs had been seen on previous missions, but for the first time in the war, the Russian-made MiG attacked American aircraft. Zinc-2, an F-105D flown by Captain James A. Magnuson, had its flight bounced by a MiG-17. As Zinc lead was breaking into a shake, a MiG on his tail, Zinc-2 was hit and radioed that he was heading for the Gulf if he could maintain control of his aircraft. The other aircraft were busy evading the MiGs, and Magnuson radioed several times before Steel Lead responded and instructed him to tune his radio to the rescue frequency. Magnuson's aircraft finally ditched over the Gulf of Tonkin, near an island of Homing, and he was never seen or heard from again. He was listed as missing in action. Captain Walter F. Draggers, A1H, probably an escort for rescue teams, was shot down over the Gulf of Tonkin just northeast of the Dragon that day. Dragger's aircraft was seen to crash in flames, but no parachute was observed. Dragger was also listed as missing in action. The remaining aircraft to return to their bases discouraged. All over 300 bombs scored hits on the second strike. The bridge still stood. From April to September 1965, 19 more pilots were shot down in the general vicinity of the Dragon, including many who were captured and released, including Howie Rutledge, Gerald Coffey, Paul Galanti, Jeremiah Denton, Bill Deschutes, and James Stockdale. Then on 16 September 1965, Colonel Robbie Reisner's F-105D was shot down a few miles north of the bridge he had tried to destroy the previous April. As he landed, Reisner tore his knee painfully, a condi condition which contributed to his ultimate capture by the North Vietnamese. Reisner was held in and around Hanoi until his release in 1973, but while a POW, he was held in solitary confinement for four and a half years. Besides the normal illnesses common to POWs, Reisner also suffered from kidney stones which severely debilitated him in the spring and summer of 1967. By September 1965, an innovative concept had taken shape, mass focusing the energy of certain high-explosive weapons. The Air Force quickly saw its application against the old dragon and devised a plan to destroy the bridge using the new weapon. They would call the operation Carolina Moon. The plan necessitated two C-130 aircraft dropping the weapon, a rather large pancake-shaped affair, 8 feet in diameter, 2.5 feet thick, and weighing 5,000 pounds. The C-130s would fly below 500 feet to evade the radar along a 43-mile route, which meant the C-130s would be vulnerable to enemy attack for about 17 minutes, and drop the bombs which would float down the Song Ma River, where it would pass under the dragon's jaw, then detonate when the sensors in the bomb detected the metal of the bridge structure. Because the slow-moving C-130s would need protection, 
F-4 Phantoms would fly a diversionary attack to the south, using flares and bombs on the highway just before the C-130 was to drop its ordnance. The F-4s were to enter their target area at 300 feet, attack at 50 foot, and pull off the target back to 300 foot for subsequent attacks. Additionally, an EB-66 was tasked to jam the radar in the area during the attack period. Since Reisner had been shot down in September, 15 more pilots had been downed in the bridge region. Everybody knew it was hot. The first C-130 to be flown by Major Richard T. Reamers and the second by Major Thomas F. Case, both of whom had been through extensive training for the mission at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, and had been deployed to Vietnam only two weeks before. Ten mass focus weapons were provided, allowing for a second mission should the first fail to accomplish the desired results. Last-minute changes to coincide with up-to-date intelligence included one that would be very significant in the next days. Major Reamers felt that the aircraft was tough enough to survive moderate anti-aircraft artillery hits and gain enough altitude should bailout be necessary. Major Crace agreed that the aircraft could take the hits, but the low-level flight would preclude a controlled bailout situation. With these conflicting philosophies and the fact that either parachutes or flak vests could be worn, but not both. Major Reamers decided that his crew would wear parachutes and stack their flak vests on the floor of the aircraft. Major Case decided that his crew would wear only the flak vests and store the parachutes. On the night of May, May 30th, Major Reamers and his crew, including Navigators Captain Norman G. Clanton, First Lieutenant William Rocky Edmondson departed Dang Nang at 25 minutes past midnight and headed north under radio silence. Although the Herky Bird encountered no resistance at the beginning of its approach, heavy, although luckily and in their accurate, ground fire was encountered after it was too late to turn back. The five weapons were dropped successfully in the river and Major Reamers made for the safety of the Gulf of Tonkin. The operation had gone flawlessly and the C-130 was safe. Although the diversionary attack had drawn fire, both F-4s returned to Thailand unscathed. Unfortunately, the excitement of the crew was short-lived because the recon photos taken at dawn showed that there was no noticeable damage to the bridge, nor was any trace of the bombs found. A second mission was planned for the night of May 31st. The plan for Major Case's crew was basically the same with the exception of a minor time change and slight modification to the flight route. Crew change was made when Major Case asked First Lieutenant Edmondson, the navigator from the previous night mission, to go along on this one because of his experience from the night before. The rest of the crew included Captain Emmett R. McDonald, First Lieutenant Armin D. Shingledecker, First Lieutenant Harold J. Zook, Staff Sergeant Bobby J. Alberton, AM-1 Elroy E. Hothworth, AM-1 Philip J. Stickley, the C-130 departed Dag Nang at 1.10 a.m. The crew aboard the F-4s to fly diversionary included Colonel Dayton Ragland. Ragland was no stranger to the conflict when he went to Vietnam. He had been shot down over Korea in 1951 and had served two years as a prisoner of war. Having flown 97 combat missions on his tour in Vietnam, Ragland was packed and ready to go home. He would fly as backseater to First Lieutenant Ned R. Harold on the mission to give the younger man more combat flight time while he operated this technical navigation and bombing equipment. The F-4s left Thailand and headed for the area south of the Dragon. About two minutes prior to the scheduled C-130 drop, time the F-4s were making their diversionary attack and crew members saw anti-aircraft fire and a large ground flash in the bridge vicinity. Major Case and his crew were never seen or heard from again. During the F-4 attack, Harold and Rangeland's aircraft was hit. On its final pass, the aircraft did not pull up but went out to sea and reported that the aircraft had taken heavy weapons fire. A ball of fire was seen as the plane went into the sea. Reconnaissance crews and search and rescue scoured the target area and the Gulf of Tonkin the next morning, finding no sign of the C-130 or its crew. Rescue planes spotted a dinghy in the area in which Harold and Rangeland's aircraft had gone down but saw no signs of life. The dinghy was sunk to prevent it falling into enemy hands. The bridge still stood. On March 1967, the U.S. Navy attacked Thanhua Bridge using a new walleye missiles that failed to knock out the bridge. Before the war ended, 54 Americans fell in the Dragon Jaw area. In late 1986, the remains of Harworth, Zook, and Case were returned 
and buried with honor befitting an American fighting man who has died for his country. Ragland, Harold, Alberton, McDonald, Edmondson, Singledecker, Stickney, Smith, Dragger, and Magnuson are still listed as missing in action. Doors above our land, flags so proudly hail. Be proud of this America. Realize. Flies in chains. Mm-hmm. 